Okay, Pounce the Kilos, new episode. We've just had a few technical difficulties, but we're away. We're um, with our first ever return guest. Kate Gordon, welcome back to Pounce the Kilos. Such was the success of Kate's first episode that we've got you back. Um, it's just because I keep showing up in your house. That's true, yes. <laughs> And we just hang out, and this like this podcast is semi pro, semi amateur, and uh, yeah, mostly amateur. Mostly amateur. <laughs> and basically, I just get my friends on whenever I can. But um, no, uh, jokes aside, we had great success in your first podcast, and you've got a lot to offer. And um, uh, for, for those that haven't listened to the first podcast um, with Kate, um, it's one of our early episodes. Go back and listen to it. And, and we spoke predominantly that day, Kate, about your journey into becoming one of the top finishing open athletes this Mm. year but now we're going to turn our attention to what is more of your profession which is like you're you're a coach and a trainer and you're on the crossfit seminar staff yeah but um recently and how how long has it been now that you've been working as a as a nutrition coach for the method it has been a year literally um coming up next month it'll be 12 months so yeah we thought we would dive into this topic and there's a lot of meat on the bone in fact maybe you can speak to this i cannot believe how many podcasts are out there about nutrition? Oh, yeah, there's so much. There's so much information. It's completely overwhelming. So I recently, just for the purpose of experimenting with it, I tried keto because there's just so much of a like, buzz about it. And I was mm. like, I need to try this. Mm. There's like 17 podcasts on keto. Mm. And then there's like probably like just... Like purely a, on keto. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Like, and I'm not talking about episode. episodes. Yeah. I'm talking the podcast yeah. on keto. So it's just, I'm blown away by the amount of stuff out there. Um, we're going to dive into it. The format we're going to follow is we, we threw it out to the Instagram world, some questions that people might want to hear about nutrition. Um, but before we answer any of those questions, and we're not going to answer them all, we're going to sort of use them as a springboard. I have a question for you, and mm. it's a question that we've talked about before. Um, nutrition and diet and, and even training. <laughs> Why should people be consulting a nutrition coach who potentially doesn't have a degree in nutrition, potentially doesn't have a master's in dietetics, um, potentially isn't a doctor or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like there seems to be a rising tide of people turning towards people like yourself and companies like The Method. What can they offer compared to, or what? why should we listen to you? That's my first question. Yeah, um, yeah it is. Like, I mean, those companies are growing a lot. Hey, they're, they're sort of springing up all over the place. Yep. Um, and the method's been going for two years now. I've been with them for one. And um, really, I guess the first thing is that we are not here to diagnose and interpret symptoms mm. and um, prescribe people anything beyond what are you doing with your lifestyle? What are you eating for breakfast? What's your training looking like? And how mm. are you responding to those things yep. based on the metrics of most of the time, what the photos of your body are looking like, yep. how you're feeling in training, and then also you know we'll do your body weight and we'll do measurements and, and we'll do things like that. Sure. But I think like the misconception is that you have to have a piece of paper that tells you that you have all this knowledge and you have all these things and all all of this information to offer. But the fact of the matter is, is that for majority of my clients, it is the basics that we are trying to get right. Yeah. And I think it's really, really. I mean, and I don't want to say simple, but it's simple, it's not easy, but it's simple to actually have a look at someone's day-to-day lives and pretty quickly find where the problems are. Mm. And, and maybe maybe you don't understand the mechanism that produces the problem. It's the same thing when we're coaching. Yeah. It's like, hey, if someone's jamming their knees forward and they're rolling in, I don't necessarily need to know what muscle or what anatomy is not functioning right. Mm. What I need to know is how do I get them to sit onto their heels and push their knees out? Mm. And that is the step that we take at the method with the, with the nutrition coaches. You've got someone that you talk to every single week and you tell them how your week went and what things went well, what things didn't go well. That's the big one. Um, and we slowly kind of investigate what's happening. And by asking really good questions, we get people the results that they need to put them on the path towards um, health and fitness. Mm. And I guess, you know, the other thing is like, what's the alternative? They're going to go to their GP who's going to tell them to eat high carbs, low fat, mm. or they're going to go buy a fucking isogenics shake, fucking juice detox, like don't eat and have just a protein shake instead from like the PT. We're now an From the PT around the corner, like there's not a lot of options out there no, that no, no. kind of are serving people well and I think that um, the method and, and having a coach that you're checking in with like 
it's 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 once something that works really well for me and i've had a lot of success with my clients so um the simplicity of it i think is confronting for people and i like the parallels that you've drawn with training because i i found that when i first started as a crossfit trainer there's like a how could you be training people with just a level one mm. but it's like you said like if i can get them into good positions by saying knees out hips back and diagnosing the problem that way how is that any less effective than understanding all the anatomy which is still relevant oh god yeah absolutely, you have that absolutely. Stuff. and i'm not trying to undermine that stuff. having a degree and having the, the piece of paper yeah um okay so with that in mind i think it's the second question that i have for you then is is there scenarios where you have been like do you know what this is out of my scope of practice this is something beyond what i yeah. can help someone yeah absolutely um and there's two different people. There are people who think that they've got problems yep. and actually just need to look at the basics. Like yep. what, what? Like most people are just stressed out of their minds, not sleeping, not eating the right kind of food, like not, not eating whole foods. Yep. Um, and they're like, ah, oh, I, think, I think I have hormonal issues. And I'm like, you know what? Cool, maybe you do, but let's address these things. Yep. And if you're still suffering with this issue, with these symptoms, then let's get you referred to someone and let's get you to see a specialist. Mm. And then the other type of person that I get is someone who comes to me who already has been seeing a specialist, who already knows their issue, who already knows what they can and can't do yeah. and what struggles that they're kind of dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And they have gone out of like on their own and gotten the information that they need to mm. take care of themselves. Okay. And they're just looking for accountability. They're just looking for direction and they just need some guidance really. Okay. Um, and, and that's the person that usually has got a, a real, um, and I don't want to say it's a real problem, but someone who's dealing with something a bit more serious yep. that is way outside of the scope of my practice yep, and, sure. and my kind of knowledge. So, okay. For me, it seems like there's, there's two distinct roles that you play and one is educating people mm -hmm. and then the second is getting them to actually do the thing yeah so do the thing is the hard yeah thing. <laughs> the unraveling of, of of the why are you behaving like mm -hmm. that which mm -hmm. is you know it's it's really challenging to make people do things in any in any scope so when do you find like let's say i'm a new i'm a new client with the method i'm an, an average person mm -hmm. like my my knowledge with coming into this is fairly average at what point do you find yourself departing from this is what you need to do to this is how you do it? Like, when does that transition take place? Um, in terms, so... Um, when do you stop telling them about why good food is good food and stuff like that and then trying to figure out how to get them, give them the tools to eat like that? Yeah, do you know, you probably never stop giving them, like, the information. And I okay. think the, the thing is, is that... Um, everybody needs reminders. Mm. It's the same, and here's another parallel to coaching. It's the same reason that someone I've been coaching for three years, I'm still trying to fix the same issues a lot of the time, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. or like it's maybe not the same issues, but the same cues are being used because you need to repeat yourself and yes. people need that. Um, in saying that, there definitely comes a time where people don't need any more information mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and people just need to either adhere closer to the numbers or the behaviors or change some things in their lifestyle. Um, it, it really, it would make a lot of sense if you asked me that question and everybody was just on a linear path of progress, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's just not the case. That's so the, yeah, okay, I give information cool. when it's needed. If people can actually create change and apply it and do the things, then we take the next step and we give new information. If okay. not, then it's actually about like the the second part of your question, which is the how how do I do this? How, mm. What do I need to change? Where do I go? Um, I, this isn't working, I, and I understand what you're saying, but this is the struggle. Mm. So you've got to kind of rumble around with that with that stuff, depending on the person. Before we start referring to some of the questions we got, you've worked you work for yourself, and you've had nutrition coaches. Mm. What's been the most profound thing on a personal level for you? So, um, do you know what? just how bad I simply have to work on the big ticket items mm -hmm. and what are they what are the big ticket items sleep and not having sugar okay. like literally it's okay. like those are the two things I love food I absolutely love food yeah <laughs> and I could eat till the cows come home so for me it's like I just have to continue to meal prep and mm -hmm. cook from home mm -hmm. for the majority of my meals yes and then that's what keeps me away from sugar or processed or refined okay. foods and then i just have to be disciplined about my bedtime routine and, and, okay. and doing some practices that help me relax and help me get some good quality sleep because 
those two things had the biggest impact on my training, on my comp- composition, on my performance in the gym. Right. Um, do they go hand in hand as well? If you start losing sleep, do you start eating poorly? Oh, God, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's this horrible loop. It's awful. Yep. So, I mean, I have no breakthrough information. And I've done, like, especially recently, I've been tracking my blood pressure, my heart rate variability, my rest, resting heart rate upon waking. Um, I, I do all my food weighed and mm-hmm. measured to, like, you know, as accurate as possible. I, I weigh my, like, all of the metrics and all the data and as much information as I can get my hands on. The blood test from the doctor, like, the naturopath for six months, like, everything that I've done to this day, I'm like, you know what? I just have to eat whole foods. Mm. Make sure I sleep enough and get intensity in the gym. Yeah, look. And you know what? That's way harder to do than it sounds way like. Way <laughs> harder to do. And I think if people were hoping to listen to this podcast and get this, oh, great, we're going to get, I'm going to get this thing, that, or like I'm going to get a secret here that's going to fix yeah. my nutrition problems. It doesn't, it doesn't quite work like that. However, I reckon we've got some stuff that we can um, look at. And look, these are questions that we both received on Instagram, um, given that you've got about 14,000 more followers than me. Um, <laughs> most of them were sent to you, but I've got a few too, folks, just so we're clear on that. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a bit of a, a hard one because I think we should start there. Someone was asking for suggestions on overcoming binge eating or emotional eating. Yeah. What have you done with somebody like that? Um, that is a really big question. Um, I would almost put them in two different pools, like emotional eating and binge eating is two different um, behaviors okay. and two different ways of eating. Um, emotional eating can be anything as as far as how I would define it as someone who responds to negative po- um, experiences, positive experiences, social environment by just like eating food and food okay. seems to be sure. the, the first reach um, when dealing with with. Anything, yes. anything, and, okay. and, and like I say, positive as well because it's how we, you know, and it's how people celebrate. And so how people, you can be a binge eater who actually sort emotional of, eater. Emotional sorry, eater. I'm sorry, you can be yeah. an emotional eater when you're the person that's like, hey, I'm going to get into the spirit of Christmas. Exactly, okay. exactly, yeah, right. and and you know, it's also about hey, we. I think everybody's an emotional eater to a degree. It's mm. just how far down, how, at what point on the spectrum are you, and and is it creating some kind of negative repercussion in your life. Before we go to binge eating, mm. I think it's what, like the, uh, it's a really great definition. So how do you, if you're an emotional eater, because mm. every, like you said, everyone is to a degree, how do we manage that? Um, first thing is, if you're an emotional eater, um, is it because you're experiencing guilt or shame or are you upset with your habits? Is it something that you feel like you can't control? Mm. Um, does it make you depressed? Is, is it something, you know, like, there's got to be um, attachments to the behavior that kind of help you understand if the emotional eating is something that's really creating a bad experience right. for you, even if you're eating in response to something good happening to your life. Okay. So, yeah, I guess overcoming that stuff is never going to be a, hey, do, do this, this you will get better within six weeks. Yes. Um, you have to have awareness of when you're doing it and, and what it is that you're doing it, uh, why, why it is that you're doing it. So I think um, a lot of people tend to do it mindlessly. Mm. Like a lot of people mindlessly just reach to food. It's the first thing that they do. It's so funny you say that because right now I can't even think when I would do it, but I know I do it and I'm just trying to build some awareness around it. Yeah. Just based on what you said. Do, yeah. do you know when you emotionally ate? Um, or did? Well, yeah, I think um, I probably eat um, like emotionally when I'm when I'm around people. If I'm in a social environment yeah, where okay. it's like, but I would classify myself as more of someone who ex- like express like binge eating tendencies. Okay, cool. And now when we flip to binge yeah, eating, like emotional it. eating, it, they can happen at the same time. They sure, certainly sure, can, sure. you know, cross over. It's not like there's a way to split them in half, and it's like one one group is here and one group is okay, here they, yep. they overlap yep. but um the binge eating stuff is certainly from what i've seen and what i've experienced and, and what i've um, had with the people that i'm coaching is it comes from someone who is got a history with yo-yo dieting they've gained weight they've lost weight they've gained weight they've lost weight they've constantly been dieting and if they're yep. not dieting yep. they're eating like a complete ass okay so, so it's like you're either all in or you're all out yep. and that's the personality it's the extremes it's the perfectionist it's the person who's like i am 100 percent or i'm nothing Is and when common? i'm nothing oh god yeah absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. massively common it sounds um, common especially way. because like you know what i said before it's like um, the people's go-to is the 12-week 
transformation. The eight week F45 program of eating 1200 yeah. calories. Yep. The under eat, over trained for X period of time to create massive weight loss, mm. which creates success, but it's completely unsustainable. Okay. So then you go the back end of that diet, of that transformation yep. is like what happens from the before and after photo is there's a thing that creates the after after photo and it's mm. binge eating, eating like and feeling horrible, feeling guilty, feeling shame, not knowing how to create something that was completely unsustainable for your everyday life. Because there isn't a way to do that. So you're speaking a lot of sense right now. So it, you reckon with most people that binge eat, you could probably, previous to that binging experience, find something earlier which was the opposite extreme of like, I'm exactly. not going to eat or I'm, so, I'm eating vegetables yes, or whatever. And that yeah. was the biggest light bulb moment for me. It wasn't that I was eating too much and that was the problem. Yes. The problem was that I was restricting and depriving and like dieting and constantly mm. trying to not eat. Yes. So that was the actual cause. The binge is the symptom. Mm. Okay, that's, that is, I hope our listeners are mm. paying close attention. They, that's some fascinating stuff. And it moves me to the second question, which is, do you ever fast and why? Yeah, okay, cool. So I've been asked this before and I have got a couple of my clients fasting, um, a couple of people who it's really, <clears throat> really worked for and a couple of mm -hmm. people who it hasn't. Mm -hmm. I was doing some fasting and I really didn't like it mostly because I have to eat a lot of food. Like I eat, um, at the time I was eating 2,700 calories. There were a couple of days where I was eating 3,000 and it was like, man, if I have an eight hour window for eating and I train for two hours in that window, it's like trying to get 3,000 calories down in six hours. It's just like... I was feeling pretty, 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 average. Yuck, pretty yuck, yuck. I it was just too hard on my digestive system. So I, I pulled the plug on that, but I do have clients that do 16, eight fast, 16 hours of no eating, eight hour eating window and feel amazing. And it resolves issues with digestion. It gives them way more energy. They have mental clarity. Like they have all these really great things that yep. come out of that. Um, and then I have other people who the same things happen to me. That be their experience. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Or it starts to lend itself to that binge, binge eating mentality. So why does the people that are successful with fasting and, and it sounds like you've got some, even though mm. eight, sixteen, sixteen, eight is not an extreme fast. It's, it's a fast, but it's not mm. an extreme one. How, why are they successful? Why don't they binge? Is it just because in the in the eating window they're doing good quality? Yeah, food? good quality. Um, and they also have not got that same kind of emotional attachment to food they they eat what they want there's right. no there's no restriction there's no deprivation they they eat for health they're not trying to lose weight they're not dieting so mm -hmm. i think the problem is when you have someone intermittent fasting to lose weight mm -hmm. and it's just another like i'm just going to go eight weeks 12 weeks three months and i'm just going to cut a whole lot of weight and it's like well i mean you can probably get the same results by just restricting your caloric intake it's yeah. the same thing the intermittent fasting works so well as a weight loss method is because you it creates a caloric deficit yeah. and it's such a simple rule to follow mm. it's not about good food bad food it's not about here's what you can eat here's what time you have to eat it here are the meal plans it's just eat now don't eat now yeah but like those are the two that's literally all you have to do eat at this point don't eat at this point hey so when you said simple rule to follow I'm, I'm interested by that because how often will you prescribe something to somebody because you know they can follow it as opposed to you know what might be best to them as in it's like hey I don't know if that's necessarily the best thing mm -hmm. but I actually know you can do that so you should do that whereas this is probably the best thing but if we try that you're going to fail yeah. do you do that like do you find yourself in that yeah i do often? because you have to meet with people where they're at like okay. you just have to you you have to have that empathy and that understanding of where people are coming from and sure. a lot of that means um when i can push somebody so here's an example i have a client um and the guys in the method are not going to be happy about this she was on uh four nightly check-ins and mm. she actually wanted to go back to weekly mm. and the whole reason was that she just felt like she needed that extra catch up with me. Right. And I actually turned around and was like, hey, I don't believe that you need to talk to me. What you need to do is yeah. to learn to do it on your own and and look at what you're succeeding at rather than looking at all the ways that you're failing it and figure out, hey, 
I'm succeeding at this, and if I'm not succeeding at something, what do I need to do right. in order to fix that? So, did you think that maybe by going back to once a week, she would potentially start failing at checking in, or was no, it? No, there was nothing. It was purely about her progress, like as a okay. person and, and as someone on a journey towards like making good decisions and taking care of herself, and and really just becoming more consistent. Yeah. Okay. Um. So it was really a, a bit of like a, um. Hey, I, I want to give you that independence and I want you to find it and it's going to be hard and you're going to you're going to have to have like you know weeks where you're like I had a really good week and then a really bad week follows that it's just part of it and every time that there's a bad day you can't fall back and be like this isn't working Mm. I gotta stop I gotta change it it's like no a bad day or a bad meal or a bad workout doesn't mean a bad life and it doesn't mean there's anything wrong it's just like hey you got to work through that and keep going and sure. then if it repeats itself maybe we've got a problem you but, but you have to continue to work through it and then the opposite will happen where I'll have people that um, will want to do one thing and I'll tell them to do something completely different so okay. most of the time people that want to become more extreme and I'm like no don't, go don't I yeah. need you to incorporate I need you to actually go and out and eat something that you're craving. Like, if you have a yeah, craving, yeah. learn to satisfy it because if you all that, hold off. yeah, all that happens is like you're like, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. Yeah. Sunday night, like at home on your own, you fucking cave and you just got <laughs> absolutely ballistic. <laughs> Stop yelling. <laughs> Sorry, it's getting very personal. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears on you a little bit and just double back to something that we talked about earlier. Somebody asked us about eating for gut health and eating for hormone health. Um, we talked at the start of the show, you're not a doctor, you're not a nutritionist, but it's something that like, it's, it's just so prevalent that people are asking about gut health and hormone health. What do you tell people in relation to that stuff? Um, do you know what, in terms of like being healthy as opposed to like, Hey, I have an issue with gut health, hormone health, like in terms of just being healthy and, and trying to take care of those things, Mm -hmm. it's the same advice that I give to every single person, whether it's gut, whether it's hormonal, whether it's whatever, it's like, Hey, eat whole foods, avoid sugar Mm -hmm. and get some sleep. Okay. Like pretty much it's like, Hey, manage your stress, eat real food, like incorporate more vegetables, get more diversity of color and type. Um, and that's that's really yeah. kind of it. it and whether like the it's scientific, or whether it's gut. the scientific mechanism by which doing those things then assists gut and hormone health. It, it doesn't really matter, provided you're feeling healthy and those things are on point. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like the prescription is the same, like for everybody. Um, and there's nothing super special that I think anybody really needs to do. We can certainly incorporate more things that can potentially be beneficial for the gut, like yep. fermented foods. Yes. But what is that? That's just pickled vegetables. Mm, like okay. really, so yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. more vegetables. Um, then same thing for like hormonal health. It's like, hey, well maybe I'm gonna incorporate more more seeds or more, more, more types of foods that are gonna give me the vitamins and minerals that mm-hmm. perhaps I'm deficient in. Yes. But that's it. It's literally like what, it, what, what you're eating is purely trying to create a bigger, more diverse amount of or intake of vitamins and minerals yeah, that it, are essential to life. Like that's what it comes down to. If I can share a story that you were involved in, do you remember when um, I was at your house and I'm like, do you have any bone broth? Yeah. <laughs> like I don't, I, I've done enough research on bone broth to understand its mechanism, but I don't fully understand like the, the hype around it mm. and I haven't done as much research as somebody else, but here's what I know that when my gut isn't feeling amazing, that is something that makes it feel better. Yeah, and it was almost instantly. It you was pretty like, good. You there was a bit of a placebo I effect. I was, was like, peeled over alive. in this car. <laughs> Look, you're going wrong. And you're like, I do, I'll bring some out. Um, so like that, that for me is like, that's a classic example of it's like, yeah, look, I don't know the science behind it too much but that thing's working for me. Exactly, and that's the thing. It's like if people introduce different types of food to their diet and they if they have this response to it, it's like, cool, there's your diet that works for you. Yep. Other people are not gonna feel a, a difference. A, a example for me, I have just stopped, take, stopped taking all supplements. Mm. Mostly because I just ran out of everything. Yep. Honestly, haven't noticed a difference. Mm. Haven't noticed a difference. I've got a whole ton of stuff coming over. Did you take for sure? Yeah, I do on days I'm not eating a lot of fish. Okay. Um, so I have cool. salmon a couple times a week. So yep. I usually supplement with a lot of extra on, on days I don't. Do you notice it if you're missing fish oil? I guess you haven't. Yeah, right. I really, that's the thing. I'm like, I do it because I know like, 
I, I eat a lot, so I do eat a lot of omega sixes because yeah, I yeah, have yeah. hydrogenated oils or refined oils. So, like, I know that I probably am getting a little bit too much of that. So I'll try and supplement with the omega three. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I do, but I, I don't notice a difference. Now, when you're doing macros for people, and you know what? Before I ask this question, I ask this first question: Where do you start calculating somebody's macros? Like, they come to you for the first time, they send you a few pics, and I'm sure it's more detailed than that, but where do you start for most people? How do you start? Do you know what? We do not prescribe macros in your first week. Mm. We actually do not give out numbers until someone has tracked for a week. Okay. What it does is it gives them an opportunity to learn how to just weigh and measure their food and start getting their head around that. They don't need to make any changes around what they're eating. Most of the time people come to us because they're ready to make change. So they tend to eat a they're little bit more it. healthier. Sure, sure. Um, and if anything, often they'll kind of under eat a little bit. But what we actually want to see is what you're already eating and where we need to fill in the gaps. Right. So I'll have people that come to me that barely eat any protein. Um, I have athletes that come to me that barely eat any carbohydrates and it's not so much about me being like, oh, I'm just going to look at you and be like, you need this much you protein, this. fat and carbs. This is what you need and here you go, you're away. Yep. Um, it's like, hey, show me what you're eating in the past week or two. Awesome. I can immediately see that you need to be eating more carbs. Let me jack those up. Let's see how you feel. You feel good on that? Huh, sweet. Cool, like awesome. What about we add some more fat there? Add a little bit of this in for your breakfast. Like have that, have some uh, nut butter with your oats. Yeah. Oh my God, you feel really good in training. You don't get hungry at midday. Like beautiful. It's literally that. That's the way to go. I mean, it, like you said, we're, we're reiterating the same point over again that it's so simple when mm. you say it like that. It's so hard to execute <laughs> in, in real life. Um, but you do change people's macros as they develop or mm -hmm. as they train and they, they change. What's the difference between, uh, I guess, if you can distinguish eating for health and then eating for performance? Because that was another question that came up yeah. a few times. It's like, hey, you're an athlete. How do you eat differently from somebody who is just like, hey, I just, I just want to lose weight. I'm not an athlete. Mm -hmm. They don't identify as that. So being healthy is the same for anybody. Like there's no distinct, distinction between um, or difference between like me competing at the games in six weeks versus um, my client who is... 35 and has like a newborn and is like mm. like just that's that's what they do there's no massive amount of training yep. i'm like health is still the same so i'm still trying to eat just as many vegetables as i'm trying to get that client to eat mm -hmm. um however depending on your goal that's when we think see things change okay. and it's the same thing with training in the gym mm. if you're just trying to be like if your goal is to just head towards well-being then you're training one session a day like yeah. that's that's the way you focus yeah, it you're yeah, just trying to yeah. get intensity a bit of variety like sure. that kind of stuff um in eating if your goal is competition then we are trying to give you as much food as possible mm -hmm. without giving you any negative um any negative changes in your body composition okay so then for health if you just want to be a healthy person, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, I want to get you eating as, as much as we, you're comfortable with without, uh, without changing your body composition in, yep. in a negative manner. Um, sometimes that depends on and what someone prefers. And then also, you majority of my clients come to me wanting to lean out. So then the same thing happens. If they want to lean out, my goal is to try and get them on um, the maximum calories that they can be eating, especially if they're training, which a lot of my clients are CrossFit is, the maximum calories to still elicit weight loss. Yes, okay. Um, I was gonna ask you, calorie deficit seems to be something that I've, I've seen you post about before, and the key to losing weight is mm -hmm. like, the, sorry, the key to uh, several different diets that people might approach is that they put you in calorie deficit. So can, can you speak a little bit to that? The idea mm. that keto, macros, paleo, zone, all that stuff really is just a different method by which to um, achieve calorie deficit. Like, yeah. is, that, is that a real thing? So or is that a let me simple? clarify with that. When I start talking about calorie deficit being like Kind of the solution and, and the reason that any diet that you do is successful, I'm speaking specifically about weight loss. Weight loss, yes. Yeah. But keto, yep. fasting, paleo, zone diet, mm -hmm. there are so many other benefits that are going to pertain to your health, mm. not necessarily weight loss. Yes. Okay. So it's not a blow off of those diets by any means. Yep. It certainly is for that person who's like, what's the right diet for me? There's not really anything special about them. It's just that if you're looking to lose weight, 
they create a calorie deficit. Mm. So you suddenly are going to accomplish your goal of losing weight. Mm. Um, now, mm. you can also go and choose keto for other reasons or fasting for other reasons, yep, right? Yep, yep, yep. Um, and people are certainly benefiting from doing those things. Yep. You cannot argue with um, the research that, that's out there um, or the experiences that people are having with those diets. Yeah. Um, so it's certainly not like a, yeah, fuck those things. It's just because they're in a calorie deficit. It's just that it is... It's a reality of losing loss. weight. Yeah, it's like it's it, it can be as simple as hey, you don't have to do keto. I had one, a really good buddy of mine um, from the US. He's like, hey, I've just started doing keto. I'm three days in. I feel awesome. My my friend did it, and like they're just looking so good. Like, can you just give me a guideline of like what calories I should be hitting or what macros I should be hitting? And I was like, dude, um, what's your goal? Yeah, yeah. And he just literally wants to like lean out, and I was like. There is nothing special about keto for leaning out. Yes. Is this how you're going to eat for the rest of your life? Yep. Can you sustain this? Is mm -hmm. this something that you can do for the long term? If it is, hell yeah. Like, awesome, buddy. Like, that's, I'm then so you excited. Should, you should do it. Yeah, do you it found the thing. It. Yeah. But if you're just looking for weight loss, you can eat how you're eating, eat a little less. Yes. And accomplish the same results in a manner that will be way more sustainable for you, yep. something that will give you long-term results as opposed to the short-term results where 95% of diets fail because within one to three years, people are gaining the weight they lost back, if not more. Like that's the reality of so many of those diets because you're looking for those for the answer for weight loss. Yes. If you're looking to just be healthy and that's what you're invested in, different story. It's a different thing. Um, do you think most people, or sorry, not most people, in the roles that we have as trainers and you as a nutrition coach, have you tried some stuff that you're like, eh, I really don't know of the value of this, but I'm going to try it. I'm going to basically do an experiment on myself to see if it works. Have you done that much? Yeah, the intermittent fasting was one. Um, that was because Danny Haran, who um, my coach, was doing it. And I was like, mm. I have no experiences with this. So okay. I did that. Um, I've also increased my fats a lot and played around with that. Um, but more recently, I've been getting a little bit of coaching from another company and, and just playing around with some of the things that they've had me do. So cool. just, uh, I guess I'm, I'm constantly experimenting to the point yeah. of I've done so much now. And again, I keep coming back to the big ticket items where I'm like, you know what? All those 1% is they're great and I love them and I am invested in them and I can't, I would never undermine the impact of the little things. But I also know that I don't need to worry about those until I've got the big things in check. Okay. So yeah, I keep coming kind of back around to those big things. So I've definitely tried some things, but um, for me personally, it's like I know what I have to work on. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Okay, I need to hear from our sponsor for this episode, which is your company, because we have a special discount code for hey. you guys. So um, we'll be back in a second. I'm going to fire some quick questions at Kate. Hey guys, use the code pounds to kilos when signing up for the method and receive $5 off your weekly membership cost for the entire lifetime of your membership. Enjoy. Now that you have your code for the method, um, hopefully by speaking or listening to Kate in the last little bit, you'll have seen that um, she's got a lot to offer and she's one of their top coaches. So um, I hope you take advantage of using that code. The method have been extremely generous to me in terms of helping me promote the show. And this is the second person from the method, that, the method that I've had on. Mm. Now, Kate, to round this up, I have developed my own list of super questions. Let's face it, when you put out the questions on Instagram, I asked a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I'm gonna use this to my advantage. I, just, I think you asked three. Yeah. And they're all very formal. Yeah, I know, because I, like, I was like, I can 100 hello, good Kate. <laughs> um, okay. I'm gonna ask you some questions and I'm gonna give you, not a time limit, but I want you to try and um, we're going to press on from each question okay. relatively quickly. Okay. So I need you, I like if it requires further explanation, time. give it further explanation. That's what I'll go. Right. Um, high carb or high fat? Depends. I'd probably lean towards high fat. Okay. For gen pop people. Okay. Interesting. Um, are cheat meals a, f a healthy thing? The... Um, the word cheat meal and that whole mentality of I need to have a cheat meal, I think that that has completely come out of diet culture and I think it's a horrible, horrible um, term that just is entrenched in, in people's mentalities. I like it. I think people can eat whatever the hell food they want to eat and I don't think it has to be good or bad. Excellent. Um, what's the best pre-workout? Food. Okay. Can we have Real further? Food. <laughs> <laughs> 
Real food, real food. There's nothing special about pre-workouts. What you feel good in with in your belly before training. I eat um, usually two hours before training. I can't go much closer than yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And I usually try and eat something along the lines of um, like sometimes like carbs and like some nut butter, okay. like oats and nut butter or um, banana or I'll have an actual like, I'm gonna sit down and have some chicken, rice and veggies. I'm gonna do us here. It felt like when I started training, like even just exercising when I was a teen, that the pre-workout meal was such a thing. And now it's becoming less. It's same thing with post workout. People are like, what should I have after a workout? And yeah. it's like, man, just eat food. Like, yeah, yeah. like I'm generally gonna prescribe people to be like, well, look, aim to have like a, a 20 to 30 gram serving of protein and a 40 to 50 gram serve of carbs before training, after training. Mm -hmm. You might avoid fats because it's just gonna slow the absorption of those macronutrients down a little bit. But for majority of people, the timing of those foods gives you such a minor like effect yes. that it's like across the day eat your food how yes. you like in ways that makes you feel good in training for some people they train faster for some people they train with just a small amount of whatever for yeah. some people it's fats some people it's carbs whatever so it's it's whatever works well for you as long as you're moving towards whole foods can you be too lean um it depends it depends on what you're willing to trade off so if you are super lean, you don't get to socialize with your friends, you have to have this lifestyle that adheres to you being able to weigh and measure all of your food and not eating a whole lot of this or a whole lot of that, um, you can't have alcohol, you you know, you know, also maybe see performance metrics drop, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. then you probably are going towards too lean, but that's some people's goal, yeah, okay. right? Yep. And then the other direction is if your health markers and your performance markers are going the right way and you're feeling good and you're happy with the way that you're doing things, keep going, that's fine. But yeah, if health markers are going in the right direction, I think that's the big one. <laughs> can you be too can you be too big? Yeah, no, I so this is my question that I put in here. Um, the reason I wanted to put this question in here is that a lot of people say, I want to lose weight so that I'm better at gymnastics. Mm -hmm. So a couple things happening here. One, it's okay if you just want to lose weight. Like it's okay, you don't have to have sure. a reason and sure. you don't have to say, ah, oh, it's because I want to be better at gymnastics. Like if you just want to look fucking good in the mirror, then like, yeah, it's okay for you to want to lean out and lose weight. You don't have to feel ashamed and feel like you need uh, a big reason that's attached to your performance in the gym. It's like, if I have ever wanted to lose weight, most of the time it's because I'm motivated by how I look at myself in the sure. mirror. As far as gymnastics goes, do you know what makes you better at gymnastics? Doing gymnastics? Yeah, getting fucking stronger and doing more gymnastics. Do you know what my best performances have been? At my heaviest. Yeah, heaviest. At my heaviest. And it's like, it just is so hard to talk to, especially people that want to train really hard and then not eat because they want to lean out, but they mm. want to keep performance like metrics going up. Oh. And I'm like, man, you know what? Maybe you would perform better at two, three kilos over the weight you're at right now. Of the statement, eat meat, vegetables, nuts, seeds, some fruit, little starch, no sugar. Which one is one most important and two least adhered to? Oh, most important? <clears throat> Probably knowing that the meat, vegetables, nuts, seeds portion is where you want to spend most of your time. Okay. Um, and then people are probably the worst at sugar thing just because okay. it's like you're surrounded by sugar. Yeah, sure. That's a, that's a, that's a very fair answer. Um, could you track your macros forever? Um, yeah, I would never do that though. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hell no. Um, and that's the same thing for you know anyone that I'm coaching and anyone that's doing macros. You have to learn how to eat as well. Mm. So doing macros is a tool. Yes. It's it's great. It's great to bring objective data to the way that you're eating and manipulate those numbers in order to change your results with regards to your body composition, your mm -hmm. performance, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, but. It's also something that people can get boxed into and then suddenly when they step outside of macros, they have no idea how to eat. And one, it's not really any different to how you ate on macros yeah, yeah, most yeah. of the time. Yep. But two, it's like people don't know how to listen to their body signals about when they're hungry, when they're full, yep. um, when they should be eating different types of food based on what they're craving. People just shut down those signals if you're constantly weighing and measuring mm. your food based on a prescription of protein, carbs, and fat. Yeah. So I've got a question, a yes. follow-up question then. Can macros make you lose a little bit of your intuition around food? Yes. Mm. Um, I don't know if you would lose intuition, 
um, but you certainly will probably experience um, more or a better and increased ability to eat intuitively without macros. What are your macros right now? Um, I'm actually, so I've been on 3,000 3, calories for about three months uh -huh. and I'm leaning out for the game, so I'm eating about 2,500. Okay, and how often do you um, get within 100 calories of that? At the moment, most days. Okay, so you're yeah, pretty, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty good at it. But, oh, actually, do you know what? No, in saying that, no, because I ate out Monday, I ate out Tuesday, um, I will be away this weekend for a seminar, so I'm probably going to be moving things around a little bit, but um, I'm certainly not going above 2,500 or below 2,300, so I'm hanging around that sort of 2,400 area. Okay, last question, and this is a question I'm giving you, it's a challenging one because I've got it before, I know you'll get it before, I'm going to give you some context as well. Somebody at the gym walks up to you and says, I want some help with my food. What's your first response to them? Um, my first response is probably going to be a question back to them. Mm -hmm. And what's the question? What are you eating right now? Okay. What did you eat for breakfast today? Mm. What's your plan for dinner tonight? Mm -hmm. um, that would be step one. Mm -hmm. Step two might be along the lines of once I have an understanding of where they're at. Yep. Step two might be along the lines of, okay, what's your goal? Okay. Most of the time, I just want to keep getting better at CrossFit, but I want to lean out. Okay, cool. Mm. So once I've uncovered how they're eating, that's going to give me an idea of, like, for example, at a seminar in Adelaide, literally two weeks ago, I had a really, really awesome participant come up to me, um, and he was like, I'm, I'm working on my nutrition. Um, I just don't know, you know, what I need to do or where I'm going with it. And I was like, cool, what are you eating? Tell me about it. And it turns out he was basically eating a whole lot of um, refined carbs, like a lot of bread, like right, right, sandwiches, right. bread for breakfast, like with toast, sandwiches for dinner and then he or for lunch. And then dinner, he was like, but I don't eat carbs at dinner. And I was like, but you've been, you, I don't know if you realize this, you've been eating carbohydrates all day. Yep. Um, and it was like a, a really big amount. And so what we kind of came to was I was like, hey, why don't you cut back on some of that stuff and, and replace it with this, have some vegetables, or if you want if you, if you you want something that's more starchy, have some potato or some, like, just change it up, um, get rid of some of the processed stuff. Um, and, and that was kind of step one. And then step two for him, he's been tracking already. I was like, cool, track again. Like, he had tracked previously and hadn't tracked in a really long time. Because mm -hmm. he was like, oh no, I have these numbers that I'm sticking to. And I was like, mm -hmm. you know what? Yeah, maybe you were but it's slowly morphed into something else. Yes. So you just need to understand exactly what you're eating now. Um, and then step three was, I can't remember what step three was. Maybe it was something along the lines of like, um, no, I don't even know. Do you know what, like what you just said though, to me, particularly at the start of when I asked you that question was quite profound. Like basically what, what your approach seems like is, I need to know where you're at and I need to know where you want to be. Mm. And then I'll use whatever I have to use to get yeah, there. exactly. And it's going to be different for two different people. Exactly. And the, like we started the show off by drawing some parallels between the way you would coach nutrition and the way we would coach somebody at CrossFit. Mm. It's very similar. Yeah. And it's like, this is where your fitness is at. This is where you want it to be. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get you there. I'm going to yeah. use whatever program, whatever combination of movements to get you to that goal that you want to get to. So it sounds very simple. And, and that's it. And the thing is, and people can do this on their own as well. People can, like, honestly take stock of what they did today with their eating mm. and what they're going to do tomorrow and what they're doing on Sunday, like across a week. What does it look like and what change can you make? And it can be the smallest possible change because generally those small changes are the ones you can be more successful with. Mm -hmm. I had one of the guys at the gym who's like, hey, I kind of want to lean out a little bit. And I'm like, okay, what does your eating look like? Monday through Friday, freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. Saturday, Sunday, I eat out and I drink and I do whatever. And I'm like, cool. Why don't you just not have beers on Saturday night for a couple months and see how you go? Just a cute Why don't you just not have an entire pizza? Like, try having half. Or mm -hmm. if you're having a burger, maybe just don't have a bun. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Or don't go out for burgers every weekend. Do yep. it every other weekend. Yep. Like, it's just those Simple. little things. And do you know what? The first week is really easy. The sixth week, and then the third month, and then the sixth month and the twelfth month, that's where it pays off, mm -hmm. and that's where it becomes challenging. So it, it makes no sense to overhaul your entire life and crush it for two weeks, and then never be able to maintain that no, totally ever not. again. Just be like, screw this, yeah. I hate dieting, I quit, I'm just going to eat it like an asshole forever. Yes. <laughs> um, what did you clean and jerk in pounds at the Downloader Championships? 
245. Uh, 111 kilos. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Um, <laughs> anything else you want to let our listeners know before we leave? No, nothing. All right, you're averaging a show every seven episodes right now, so we might see her again <laughs> in a few weeks. Thanks, guys. Keep converting pounds to kilos. Bye.